Hello, hello everyone. Uh, welcome to this webinar. I can see people joining us um, in the chat. If you could share with us where you're joining us from, that would be wonderful to see. We'll wait a couple of minutes just until people can join. Wonderful. We have people from Indonesia, Edinburgh, Sri Lanka, Hong Kong, Ireland, Italy, Kenya, Canada, London, Sweden, New York. Wow. So many different places around the world. It's lovely to see you. Thank you so much for taking the time to join us. And welcome to the webinar on mental health implementation research in action. Uh, I am your host today, I'm Jihad Bimusa. I'm a psychologist based out of Morocco and the founder of a youth mental health organization. I am also the uh, youth advisor as part of the Youth Advisory Board of Being. I'd like to start by just thanking our hosts today who have created this space of conversation for us. Um, the Being Initiative, the Lancet Psychiatry, United for Global Mental Health, and Global Mental Health Action Network. We have some wonderful speakers um, from those organizations, as well as from UNICEF and Columbia University. Thank you so much to our speakers for taking the time to uh, come and discuss some incredible reports that have been coming out recently. And thank you as well to Anthony and Aviwa, who are working behind the scenes to make all the technical side of the webinar happen as well. So we'll just jump right in and um, start. So the goal today is to really explore and discuss and learn from some of the key evidence and findings uh, from two reports, um, one by the Lancet Psychiatry on implementation research, and uh, one on a year-long study that Be the Being Initiative has been conducting in low to middle income countries. So I will start by first asking some of our speakers to introduce themselves, and then we can go into some of these reports. Um, I want to point to you that there is a Q&A box that you'll find at the bottom of your screen at any point throughout the presentations, throughout the discussions, please pop in your questions and we will collect them. And at the end of the session, we will have some time to for our speaker, speakers to answer your questions. So I'll start introductions by um, introducing Dr. Beth McGinty, who is the Chief of Division of Health Policy and Economics and Professor of Population Health Sciences at Weill Cornell Medical College. Uh, when she's not, you know, climbing some big mountains, um, I'd love to hear, you know, what else she's doing in her work. Beth, if you could share with us a little bit about your work. Sure. Thank you so much for the kind introduction. Welcome, everybody. I'm Beth McGinty, as Jihad just introduced. I am a mental health policy and implementation researcher. Much of my work marries those two areas, so I'm focused on understanding how we get policies in place and then how once they are in place, we actually uh, implement them as intended to support evidence-based mental health services. Thanks so much for having me. Thank you for joining us. Um, and we also have as the uh, co-lead of the Lancet Psychiatry Commission, Dr. Matthew Eisenberg, who is a health economist and associate professor of health policy and management and the director of the Center for Mental Health and Addiction Policy. And um, I'd love to hear when you're not visiting every pres presidential library and museum, what else do you do with your time and your work? Thank you, Jihad. It sounds like somebody found my Twitter account. Um, you can learn more about my tour of, uh, of the U.S. on there. But thank you so much for that intro. And um, thanks so much for, for having me today. Um, like Jihad said, I, I'm an economist by training. And my work is at the intersection of economics, policy, and mental health and substance use disorders. I'm really interested in um, how policies come about and, and how they impact both individual and system level um, decision making. Um, I'll pause there. Thanks so much for having me. 
Thank you so much for joining us. Um, and then from Grand Challenges Canada and the Being Initiative, we have Sahil Chopra, who is a portfolio manager. And I know him from our work in the Youth Advisory Board. He's always so lovely to have. So can you explain to us a little bit about your work managing investment portfolios within the youth mental health space? Sure, yeah. thank you so much. And I'm very excited to be a part of this webinar. Um, my name is Sahil and I work, I'm a public health professional and of course a youth advocate. And I support our global mental health portfolio with Grand Challenges Canada, Global Mental Health Innovation. We have funded more than 70 odd innovations across 30 odd countries. And uh, I'm very excited to be a part of uh, a great initiative called Bean, which we will talk about today. And I would say like you would really feel good learning about the good lessons and the uh, findings. Yeah, I'll pass it yeah, back to you. Thank you so much for joining us, Sahil. Um, we also have Dr. Milton Weinberg, who is a professor of clinical psychiatry at Columbia University. And I'd love to hear when you're not transforming the youth mental health system in Mozambique, what else do you do in your work? Thank you for that beautiful introduction. It's a pleasure to be here. I'm Venezuelan, American, and Brazilian looking for a fourth nationality, so happy to be adopted. I uh, love doing uh, training, capacity building, and sustainable research. Uh, and that's what I'm going to try to talk about because we need to move there, which I know everybody wants to. So we'd love to talk more about that. Lovely, lovely. Thank you, Dr. Milton. Uh, we also have Melvika Minaj, who is the Program Officer of MHPSS Data and Monitoring at UNICEF. And, you know, she lives in the UAE, just like I used to, so I already feel a sense of kinship. And she's always f fighting for gender equity in global health so systems. I'd love to hear what else do you do in your work within MHPSS, and especially the area of data, which is so important to all of our work. Thanks, Jihad. I'm not uh, living in the UAE, unfortunately, right now. I'm in New York, but um, I call UAE the home, so my home. So definitely uh, continued kinship with you on that. Um, I'm Mavika Manoj, and I'm a health systems and policy practitioner. And as Jihad mentioned, I work with UNICEF right now on the mental health and psychosocial support um, and data, especially data portfolio. And my primary focus is on generating, collating, and utilizing research data and evidence so we can elevate our child and adolescent mental health around the world. And very happy to be here with you all today. Thank you. Thank you so much for these lovely introductions. And thank you again for everybody who's joining us. Um, I'll just remind you again to find the Q&A box that's going to be at the bottom of your screen um, in order to share your questions. Um, I really want to make sure that your questions don't get lost in the chat. Uh, so please share your questions there throughout hearing uh, our speakers share some wonderful insights. Uh, I know sometimes that questions come up and then when we start the Q&A, you might have forgotten them. So, you know, type them in while they're, while they're still fresh and hot. Um, so we will get started first by turning our attention to the Lancet Psychiatry Commission. So I want to hear some of the, the key evidence um, that has come out of that wonderful work and the, and the report. Uh, so I'll pass it on to Dr. Beth McKinty and Dr. Be Matthew Eisenberg to uh, talk us through it. Wonderful. Thank you so much again, Jihad. I am going to start us off and Dr. Eisenberg will follow. So I am just thrilled to introduce this Lancet Commission on Transforming Mental Health Implementation Research. As you've already heard, I co-led this effort with Dr. Eisenberg, who you'll hear from in a minute. I also want to start by acknowledging by name our absolutely terrific commission team. This effort would not have happened without them. So our, our co-authors and commission members include Maggie Alegria, Renaud Bias, Jeffrey Braithwaite, Lola Cola, Doug Leslie, Natalie Moyes, Bernardo Mueller, Harold Pincus, Rahul Shadhai, Kosali Simon, Sarah Singer, Liz Stewart. And none of this uh, at all would have happened without our fabulous editor at Lancet Psychiatry, Joan Marsh. So wanted to start by acknowledging that this was a major team effort. And now my role in the next five or so minutes this morning is to introduce our commission at a relatively high level. I'll give you some context of how it came to be and a preview of what some of the key takeaways are. And then Dr. Eisenberg is going to walk through our five core recommendations in more detail. 
So this commission was really motivated by the fact that many mental health interventions, which is a term that we in the commission use broadly to include policy and system and individual treatment level interventions. So intervention with a big umbrella here. We have a lot of mental health interventions that have been shown uh, that they can successfully promote mental health and prevent and treat mental illness. But a lot of them are never fully scaled, by which I mean they never reach the large populations of people who stand to benefit from these evidence-based approaches. In one really striking example, the WHO estimates that 75 to 85% of people with severe mental illness in low and middle income countries and 35 to 50% in high income countries receive no treatment at all for their mental health condition. And the implementation gap is even wider when we turn to evidence-based prevention uh, or health promotion interventions in the mental health space. So our motivation in coming together for this commission is really that we need to know how to broadly scale mental health and interventions. And we need to transform how we're doing research, which currently for bifurcate studies of intervention effectiveness and implementation strategies to scale up interventions, to integrate uh, implementation and scaling into our research on mental health interventions from the very beginning. The growing field of implementation research aims to do exactly this, to produce evidence on how to scale effective interventions to the people who can benefit. And while progress has been made, uh, there's a lot of uh, evidence and increased attention to implementation research over the past 10 to 20 years in particular, uh, we as a field have often uh, continued to fall short in terms of really being able to produce actionable evidence that gets effective approaches into the hands of people who need them quickly. So our commission came together to make recommendations for improving mental health implementation research. Before I hand it over to talk to Dr. I, excuse me, to hand it over to Dr. Eisenberg to talk through our five uh, key principles where we make recommendations about how to transform mental health implementation research, hopefully for the better. I wanna provide just a little bit more context about how the commission did its work. So this commission came together initially based on a set of mental health implementation research considerations raised in the context of the mental health treatment gap in the United States. So a much narrower scope, US focused and clinical treatment focused. And those were some recommendations that Dr. Eisenberg and I had made in prior work. The commission convened to refine and expand these recommendations through a series of meetings and literature reviews over the course of about a year and a half. While the commission uh, takes a global health perspective and really prioritized using examples from around the world, including multiple represented on our panel today, which it's so exciting to hear from, I want to acknowledge that the Commission's recommendations are driven fairly heavily by research from high-income countries, which is because that is where most mental health implementation research to date has been funded and con conducted. And one of the really overarching uh, recommendations, points that the Commission emphasizes throughout across the as specific guiding principles that Dr. Eisenberg will talk through is that funding for mental health implementation research in low and middle income countries has to date really been dwarfed by funding to high income country based researchers, and that this creates an inequity that impedes both scientific and public mental health process. So one of the commission's really key cross-cutting recommendations that I want to highlight here is that we need increased support for research on implementation of evidence-based mental health interventions in low and middle income countries, and really an enhanced global network with two-way partnerships and two-way communication 
among mental health research and implementation partners globally across high income, low and middle income country settings so that we can learn from one another and advance mental health equity across contexts. So with that, I will hand it over to Dr. Eisenberg to give an overview in some more detail of our commission's recommendations. Thanks so much. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. McGinty. Um, uh, like you just mentioned, I'm going to uh, dive in a little bit and talk about each of these recommendations in a little bit more um, detail. Um, it's still going to be fairly high level, so I urge you to, um, if you're interested in, in learning more and, and some of the examples, of course, to read, read the report. Um, so our first recommendation is around the integrated research and implementation model that Dr. McGinty just hinted at. Um, we propose that researchers should uh, move away from the classic research, then implement sequence. Um, we find it's it's too linear and it ignores real world applications until too late. Um, our commission endorses a model where research and implementation are integrated from the start. And this is how we propose um, uh, researchers do it. We suggest that they create teams with both researchers and implementers to co-develop mental health solutions. They should educate emerging mental health leaders on this new model and involve them in practical implementation studies. And importantly, uh, we need to adjust funding structures to favor projects that combine research and implementation, ensuring that they're designed to work together from the outset. The second key recommendation in the report surrounds equity in mental health. And it's important to address this imbalance that all throughout the world, the, the heaviest mental health burdens often fall on the most disadvantaged. So we advocate for embedding equity into every stage of mental health research. And our action plan includes establishing partnerships with communities directly affected by mental health inequities. We suggest researchers should develop inf interventions informed by those who know their context best. Researchers should strategize to overcome social barriers to implementation. They should draw solutions from the communities rather than imposing external ideas onto communities. They should craft sustainable interventions with long-term impact in mind. And they should influence policy change to alter structural causes of mental health inequities. Our third recommendation is around complexity science and implementation. Here, we find that mental health solutions uh, they generally unfold within these really intricate systems, and they demand strategies that are as complex as the settings that they enter. So our commission proposes employing a complexity science perspective into research. That would entail adapting interventions to their settings while preserving their core effective elements, creating networks for ongoing learning among those implementing mental health strategies, paying attention to innovations born within community settings. These that come from the community settings may have a better chance of scaling up. And they should employ system science and other research methods to understand and guide implementation. The fourth recommendation is around a non-experimental causal inference. Uh, this one is, is close to my heart, uh, and it is, uh, well, they're all close to my heart, but uh, while randomized trials are very valuable, um, RCTs are not the only way to assess what works. So our commission encourages the broader use of non-experimental methods to establish cause and effect in real world contexts. Um, in order to do this, we suggest that researchers collaborate across disciplines to inform study designs that mirror the complexity of real life. We suggest building researcher capacity in non-experimental methods through different educational resources. We want to encourage funders and academic journals to support and publish non-experimental research findings, not just RCTs. And we want to strengthen data systems to gather comprehensive population data on mental health outcomes. The last key recommendation in the report comes from what we call the transdisciplinary approach. And what we mean by that is closing the mental health implementation gap really transcends any single field. Um, so the commission suggests a collaborative multidisciplinary strategy that engages a broader range of fields, including public policy and economics, and those that aren't traditionally involved in the implementation world. 
encourage funding agencies and research bodies to promote and financially back transdisciplinary partnerships. We suggest providing joint degrees and certificate programs that can support transdisciplinary education. And we also uh, suggest for redefining academic success to include transdisciplinary contributions. This is really important for many researchers working in academic setting as these things can influence hiring, promotion, and to eventually tenure decisions. So to briefly wrap up this phase of the, of the webinar, our commission aims at uh, starting a conversation on transforming mental health implementation research to better produce the actionable evidence needed to close the implementation gap. Uh, we say that this is an important first step and moving forward, it will be important to study and refine all of these recommendations based on new knowledge. Thank you. Thank you so much for the wonderful presentation sharing um, the results of the Lancet Psychiatry Commission, um, Commission's work. I think that there have been some um, like really important highlights made that as a practitioner, I feel like we've lived in low to middle income countries as a reality. Uh, some of the shocking statistics about the implementation gap, and I really appreciate the highlighting of, of equity, which I, I found that every point shared around strengthening data systems and moving beyond um, experimentation models uh, is is enhancing of equity, right? Like, so we're looking at what is the reality of research and implementation within low to middle income settings uh, as well. Uh, thank you so much for the wonderful presentation. Again, I will remind you, if you have any questions, please share them within the Q&A box that you will find at the bottom of your screen so we can have our speakers respond to your questions at the end of the webinar. Um, and now we will move to the next presentation, which is going to be presented um, by Sahil Chopra, uh, representing some of the work of the Being Initiative and the year-long study that has been conducted over the sp span of the past year. Perfect. Thank you so much, Hal. Um, thank you. Um, thank you all for joining this webinar and a big thanks to the organizers for this opportunity to share insights from our Being Initiative. I would say like the timing couldn't have been better as our work closely resonates with the Commission's recommendations for transforming mental health implementation research. We just heard from our esteemed speakers. So in the nine in the next nine minutes, I will just walk you through our findings and demonstrate hopefully how our approach aligns with recommendations discussed earlier by our esteemed speakers. So let's start with a quick overview of Grand Challenges Canada. Our organization, we are an innovation platform that provides seed, transition to scale, and ecosystem support for programs across three areas of impact: global health innovations, humanitarian innovation, and indigenous innovation. Our innovations challenge traditional approaches by introductions, by introducing novel solutions and enhancing effectiveness of existing, existing approaches. Our mission is simple, to save and improve more lives by 2030 through innovative solutions. Since our approach involves funding seed and transition to scale interventions, um, which is very similar to implementation research in many ways, this allows us to develop and test interventions in real world settings and it is in line with the commission's call we just heard for an integrated implementation pathway approach. Uh, importantly, our interventions are based on a bottom-up approach and are rigorously measured to understand their effectiveness within complex systems, setting the stage for a scalable delivery. Our global mental health portfolio uh, sits under GCC's global mental health innovation pillar and has been a key focus area for over 10 years, showing our strong dedication to mental health support and innovation. In 2022, we started Being, a big, ambitious global mental health initiative with focus on prevention and promotion. Being envisions a world where young people not only feel well, but thrive in the mental well-being. We support research, innovation, and build networks to prevent mental health issues. And Being is hosted by Grand Challenges Canada in partnership with Foundation Bhatna, the UK Department of Health and Social Care, the Sciences for Africa Foundation, United for Global Mental Health and Origin, which shows that a global commitment towards mental health initiatives. Before I, before I talk about our scoping analysis, I just want to also emphasize our approach. Our approach is grounded in the fundamental belief that bottom-up interventions hold the potential for scalable solutions. 
we recognize the critical role of equity in mental health, which our esteemed speaker just talked about, so that we intend to create sustainable solutions that ensure mental health support is accessible and effective for all. So in the last one year, we at GCC, we conducted scoping analysis to understand the local mental health needs of young people. What are the gaps and capacities within systems and what are the evidence base looks like in 13 priority countries? We work with local stakeholders to understand the ecosystem needs and identify most critical drivers. I think that's an important part of our research that we identify critical drivers which impact youth mental health and well-being, both negatively as well as positively. So what we did is, so we begin with, we conducted extensive desk research, uh, wherein we analyze available mental health data. This was important because we want to understand what are the gaps in information and how we can address those gaps. But the important point here is that we took an untraditional approach wherein desk research contributed to only one third of, of our efforts. 70%, or I would say most of our efforts went towards engaging with diverse stakeholders, ensuring a holistic perspective. We involved consultations with government officials, professionals in the space of mental health, education, social affairs, so and so forth, as well as researcher, researchers, civil society organizations, private sector, and most importantly, young people, and individuals with lived experience of mental health challenges. Like, like uh, Dr. Eisenberg said that we took also a multi-sectoral approach wherein we brought together varied perspectives and expertise which are required to address the complex set challenges intrinsic to delivering mental health interventions at scale. A critical aspect of our process was consensus building among stakeholders to understand, to determine the priority areas. So those priority areas which have guided our investment opportunities have been decided by the local stakeholders. The, and our partners, they use various approaches such as Delphi surveys, theory of change workshops, and gamification methods to facilitate discussions and reach consensus on critical issues. Hence, we have emerged, we have identified key driver area, which I talk about in the next slide, and it guides us our country-specific investment opportunities. Having said that, I want I also like to emphasize and acknowledge the efforts that the country partners have made. So this was implemented with the support from the country partners. There were around 26 partners who supported this work in across the team countries. So this is an important slide. Uh, on the left hand side, you would see like the important issues that emerged from our findings: depression, anxiety, and substance abuse. They emerged as significant issues across all countries. However, the six countries. Colombia, Ecuador, India, Morocco, Tanzania, and Vietnam, they have underscored the gravity of society-related issues. Many countries they have expressed challenges in obtaining prevalence data, especially on mental health, particularly concerning young individuals. And on the right-hand side, you would see like this is an important part of our exercise. We identified drivers. So each country teams listed 10 to 15 drivers, and they were agreed by the local stakeholders. So the top drivers that I just highlighted the top drivers, but uh, our report is going to be launched on 18th of April, and you would find like lot of other drivers that all the country teams have prioritized. So the, for, so the top drivers that I, I just want to talk about is one, the family dysfunction and parenting. They came out an important areas of concern across all countries, but particularly in Colombia, Egypt, India, and Pakistan. Academic pressure came out, came out as another important driver but highlighted particularly in India, Pakistan, and Egypt. And the stakeholders said that this is a significant contributor to mental health challenges. Again, the other important driver that came out was mental health literacy and stigma. It was evident in all countries, but however, it emerged from a stakeholder's perspective, it emerged as a top driver in countries like Indonesia, Senegal, and Tanzania. Stakeholders also identified like addressing youth exposure to violence is very critical and with particular focus in areas such as Colombia and Ecuador. And additionally, we've identified other challenges, which include bullying in Ghana and cyberbullying and excessive social media use in Romania, and most importantly, the impact of poverty and unemployment in countries like Senegal and Sierra Leone. In terms of the mental health policies, I'm happy, we are happy to share that almost all the countries have either implemented or they have been currently developing pertinent policies related to youth mental health with the heightened focus catalyzed by the COVID-19 pandemic. However, um, the majority of these frameworks or the guidelines still lack a specific emphasis on youth. They prioritize clinical services over preventive and promotional measures. And once we go through our public good report, the research findings that we have identified, they would, we have also identified systemic challenges, potential areas for investment, and we have also identified pre-existing networks that could support and help and catalyze our efforts in all these countries. This is our top recommendations 
Um, very quickly, first and foremost, like all esteemed speakers just said, intersectoral collaboration and coordination is such an important element for mental health space. And it is important for government ministry to government ministries to see streamline our efforts. Advocacy, advocacy is important. We need to still advocacy, advocate or or increase our efforts to advocacy to ensure youth mental health is actually prioritized within the policies, agendas, and government election plans. There's a need to increase resources towards mental health research. The one recommendation that I would feel like, which is again close to my heart, is the prioritization of mental health prevention and promotion alongside treatment strategies. Integration is a key. So we need, we need to identify ways. So how do we integrate mental health care and services within primary health care, cross-cutting programs, and educational institutions? Like I said, stigma came out as an important driver. So how do we how do we tackle stigma? How do we ensure there's a greater mental health literacy and support for health seeking behaviors? Last but not the least, it's about the monitoring and evaluation measures to ensure like we are measuring the effectiveness of existing mental health policies and interventions. This is my last slide, and I just want to summarize by saying that the scoping analysis that we did was just the first step of our implementation research. In the next four to five years, we are going to test more than 40 bold ideas, and we could support more than 20 evidence-based interventions that would be ready for scale-up. To summarize, our strategy took an integrated approach and based on three pillars, learn, invest, and mobilize. With learn, we mean that we will conduct research uh, with the help of Sciences of Africa Foundation to understand the mental health needs of young people that will guide our funding decisions. And this will be the foundation upon which our actionable policy recommendations will be built. In West, we would support youth-led and focus organizations that would focus on preventing mental health issues, and we would invest in bold innovations and help them grow sustainably. Mobilize with the help from United for Global Mental Health we understood that stakeholder engagement is going to be very crucial in our collaboration. So by building connections, engaging young people, supporting their causes, and seeking knowledge, we strengthen the foundation of our initiative. The mental health of young people is crucial for society's future, as we all know, but it is often underfunded, especially in low- and middle-income countries. So, But the Being Initiative aims to change this by learning about the challenges young people face, investing in local solutions, and mobilizing support for their well-being. With this, I'll pass up. Um, back to you, Jha. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Sahil, for your presentation. Um, I think that the Being Initiative is a wonderful example of uh, what we've seen um, in the Lancet Psychiatry Report. Uh, so it's wonderful to see that on the ground. Um, and I want to kind of bring us back to the Lancet Psychiatry Report, but with a with a, with a focus on low, low, low to middle income countries, with um, a comment from uh, Dr. Uh, Milton Weinberg, who has written a comment on the report and will share with us some of his thoughts today. Thank you. Uh, thank you, everybody. Um, uh, I'm sorry, the trying to make sure that First, congratulations, amazing job. Being initiative, get ready, because you're going to have to give us a lot of money to be able to do what you're suggesting, and we'll be there with you. And definitely, the lands, you know, you guys did a phenomenal job. And I have to say, as a reviewer, I, I, you did a beautiful job even with the reviewer's comments. So thank you so much. I was hoping you would, and you did it beautifully. So I'm going to be a little bit self-critical with all of us. Uh, how successful, which is, Beth, how you started, right? How successful have we been at doing this? And I have to remind myself all the time that I'm a clinician and a researcher, and I love that I can think both ways. So this is what has been our struggle before we talk about sustainability, which is we have mental health clinicians and policymakers who clearly don't understand research and researchers who don't understand, I'm sorry, I'm being very black and white, but there's a, a huge disparity in how they can look at each other and how they can work together. And we implementation scientists came in the middle to try to figure out how to do this. And the reality is that we're not that great either. We you know, do very little in low and middle income countries. We have amazing options of outcomes that we can produce. Yet we have models, strategies, and framework. You know, the, the language is inaccessible. I work in places where like, what? They tell me all the time. 
We have underreporting of negative findings, which is crucial to be able to know where to go. Uh, also, it often addresses one or few disorders at a time, uh, not real world activities, minimal funding, and very time limited. And there's a scan scale up studies uh, with sustainment and sustainability, which is exactly what the Lancet said. So we need to do a little bit of a better job in connecting with both sides to be able to make changes both in policy, as Matthew was saying, and with the researchers to really take us into consideration. We know all of this, and the green is exactly what Matthew mentioned, that we need to include much earlier implementation signs. But just, we know that the global burden, burden of mental illness has not improved since 1990. So all these years of science, and we're in the same place we were in 1990. Something is wrong. So we know the, the funding, how it goes and how long it takes. And the funding is so limited and only research institutes and systems are able to move things forward to scale up. In reality, most things don't move out to be research to practice with sustainment and sustainability. High income country successes take place within systems, except for medications in high income countries or antiretrovirals in low middle income countries. It never happens in many places. And the reality is uh, anyone ready to pay for what it takes uh, to be able to do that. And Anthony will be very happy that I'm gonna mention the 10% issue. So, so far, very limited, fragmented funding, policymakers, HIV funding, there's very little. And who gets funded? It's interesting. So I'm gonna quickly tell you about work that we've done, we've published, and we're having a lot of fun and we're moving into other countries where, why I'm showing this is because this was true uh, participatory research, community policy, all disorders, task shifting, step care, stratified measurement base, where we can do community screening, we can do mental individual screening, then we immediately can provide care. And all of this is very, very quickly, and I'm gonna run through it because I don't have too much time, but it's very comprehensive and we're very, very proud how we did this you know, with collaborations in Brazil, done in Mozambique and now in other countries, and we very quickly can train and provide care for all disorders. And the reality is it's integrated, it's patient services and implementation outcomes. Each provider can assess 4,300 community uh, cases and treat 1,400, so you don't need that many. Uh, we allow for prevention and promotion because we can do yearly and then do a, a prevalence and incidence. We have done an amazing, I have to tell you, Mozambicans, I have never worked with anybody in my whole world that it's like that. Every time I say, let's do something, they say, what else? But there's no funding for scale up. We don't know where to go for scale up. And that is a huge problem. We bring into the US where policymakers hopefully will make changes in the Medicaid reimbursement uh, that for people who are not part of the US, it's how the government pays for services because in the US, like in many other countries, the problem are the policymakers and clinical people who don't want non-mental health license providers to do the job that they can do. And we have data that it does. So the idea is how do we bring research to practice to scale with equity, sustainment, and sustainability of effects? In yellow, we need to include all the time the people that need to be part of it. And we need to think, what do we do? Equity is the principle with the smallest evidence. And so far it's, you know, it's aspirational. We need to do rethinking of implementation research using a global health perspective with needed emphasis of incoming macro level barriers. In global countries with very little money, in low, I'm sorry, in low and middle income countries with very little money, things are happening that can teach us how to do it in the US and in high income countries and then vice versa. And we really need to do a global mental health implementation research network. We don't have that in a way that it's functioning. Uh, funding issues, despite the outside burden, outsized burden of mental illness that hasn't changed, government invests very little. They should invest the minimum of 10%. Funding for mental health implementation research and services scale up, it's exactly the same. There's no funding for that. We need to make sure that funders provide that. And within those that provide implementation research funder, please think of renewals of successful projects with equitable and diverse representation. Otherwise we're stuck in the very little and same place of implementing and not doing scale up, which was a show in the Global Mental Health Conference by an IMH that very little was done in sustainability. And you scale up funders, it's time to decrease the research to practice gap and the burden of mental illness. So please give the money to those that deserve it. 
and it takes more than a village. It, take, it takes a, con a global participation of people in Sub-Saharan Africa, Mozambique, amazingly, and now in New York State. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Dr. Milton. I found your your statement that equity is the principle with the smallest evidence to be incredibly striking. And you know, this is we can already see that this is uh, what we're what we're talking about today. We're not just talking about the problem that exists globally within uh, research and implementation, but we're we're highlighting um, how big of a gap that is when you're when you start looking at non-Western um, or global North countries. Um, so I'll pass on um, the mic to uh, Malvika Minoj from UNICEF uh, to share with us her comments and thoughts as well. Thank you, Jihad. Um, I'd like to start by congratulating the efforts of the entire commission for the launch of this much needed report to being on the insightful research shared and to Dr. Weinberg for laying out the challenges and opportunities that persist in bringing research to practice at scale for global mental health. Um, it is my pleasure to share a few remarks on the importance of these recommendations for our work on child and adolescent mental health. Over the past few years, recognizing the critical needs and demands, including from young people themselves, UNICEF has embarked on a transformative journey to advance programmatic and policy action for mental health and psychosocial well-being. We have developed robust frameworks, operational guidelines, and adapted these across contexts to underpin the evidence-based programming that is needed for children and youth filling critical gaps in mental health support. A major milestone in this journey gui guided by the launch of UNICEF's global multi-sectoral operational framework has been the development and rollout of a costed minimum services package for mental health and psychosocial support, which is deployable across multiple emergencies, both acute and protracted. Through multi-sectoral approach, as many of the other speakers have um, iterated here today, and mixed methods, research, and data analytics, we have pivoted towards a new era of programming and partnerships that are beyond acute emergency responses or short-term immediate interventions. Quality research, data, and evidence are central to informing these efforts and, and are, have provided a foundation for identifying and filling many of the gaps that persist in mental health and psychosocial support services for young people and their caregivers. As we move forward, and there are ways to go, as speakers have mentioned today, uh, we are keen to continue to embed implementation research across our response to gain better insights into what interventions work for whom, why, when, and how across the entire humanitarian development nexus. For instance, recently, to better understand the underlying factors that influence implementation, we have been undertaking an evaluation of UNICEF's mental health and psychosocial programs. At the heart of these and other similar efforts is a fundamental commitment to strengthen evidence-based programmatic and policy action for youth mental health. Amidst this backdrop, we welcome the recommendations and insights shared by the Lancet Psychiatry Commission on transforming mental health implementation research and iterate the potential of these insights hold in advancing mental health globally. For many years, we have been contending with the no-do gap and the complexities that arise from approaching the research to implementation pathway linearly. The, the report's findings, as well as the research outlined here today, outline a clear roadmap to advance action to tackle these critical research gaps that persist in global mental health. But as Dr. Weinberg mentioned, it will take a community to come together and act on it. At UNICEF, we have implemented multi-layered and multi-sectoral mental health strategies using the socio-ecological model and across the life course of children and young people. To give one example of it, our engagement with pivotal partnerships, which include efforts like BEING, as well as through interventions such as BLOOM or the Building Lifelong Opportunities for Mental Health Initiative exemplify this approach. For instance, UNICEF, in partnership with WHO, developed the Bloom intervention utilizing transdiagnostic and contextually adaptable strategies to reach younger age children with evidence-informed psychosocial support. As part of this initiative moving forward, UNICEF will embed implementation research to assess ways to optimize reach, impact, inclusivity, and scale. 
Similar efforts are already underway across our regions, including the Middle East and North Africa region, as well as East and Southern Africa, to embed uh, implementation research into our programmatic efforts. We underscore the recommendations from the Lancet Committee to contextualize mental health implementation research for different contexts, grounded by the unique histories and local epistemologies that exist in each country. We also believe that integrating the Commission's recommendations with existing and new research, policies, health reforms, social movements, and especially for participatory action can play a significant role in reducing the current no-do gap that we know exists in global mental health. Ultimately, it will ensure that every child and adolescent has access to quality mental health and psychosocial support that is adapted and tailored to meet their unique needs globally. Thank you. Thank you so much for sharing some of the amazing work that UNICEF is doing within implementation in different contexts. Um, and now I suppose we have a little bit of time to go into some of the questions. Uh, thank you to everybody who has submitted a question within the Q&A box. Uh, I will do my best to uh, present your questions to the speaker. So if there is any shortcoming in pronunciation of names or in conveying the, the question, I, I apologize in advance as that is on me. Um, so we will start um, first by uh, taking a question um, that has, you know, we've received several questions, and I think it can be addressed to Sahil about some of the opportunities that exist um, in order to uh, partner and collaborate on Im implementation, and if there are any opportunities uh, for mental health implementation research. Uh, if there are any other opportunities that other speakers are aware of, please do share. Sure. Thank you, Tahan. I think. Um... This is a very important question because I think I missed one point and thank you for bringing this up. So we have recently recently launched our RFP and I would just share that link right now in the chat so that RFP is open for 12 countries wherein we will support three kinds of investments. One is proof of concept wherein we wanted to invite all youth-led organizations in 12 focus countries um, to, to understand, to, to fund for uh, bold ideas. And then we have transition to scale investments. If you have already proven some ideas, then we could support them for transition to scale. And then the third one is about ecosystem because we understood if we want to scale any innovation, it is important that we should create an enabling environment for that scale up. So we have launched that RFP and very excited. And this RFP is on a rolling basis and you would get a lot of information. And if you want more information, we are, Evangelist Canada has scheduled a webinar tomorrow. So please tune in and I could share more details in the chat. Thank you so much. Yeah, back to you. Thank you so much, Sahil. Uh, we have a question from Anna Roach about um, examples of non-experimental methodologies that perhaps have been found effective um, through the work of the commission that can be used in addition to or in place of the randomized control trial form of assessment. Yeah, I'm, I'm happy to, to, to take that one. Um, so there's a lot of different um, methodologies available um, to to researchers, and they have pros and and cons. Um, in the commission, we highlight um, uh, a few. So we highlight um, strong comparison group designs. So trying to um, find some type of natural experiment with a treatment group and a comparison group, and doing some type of propensity score matching in order to make the groups more comparable. We also talk about instrumental variables methods where you try to find some shock to the system that allows us to isolate quasi-random variation in um, some uh, phenomenon happening in the observational world. We also highlight regression discontinuity methods, which try to leverage um, a sharp cutoff in eligibility for some program and compare those who were just below or just above the cutoff and see how their outcomes differ. And lastly, um, we talk about difference and differences methodology, which is very common in um, policy evaluation um, context. And this is the, the more classic natural experiment um, method where you look for some locality that implemented a policy, some another one that didn't, and look before and after um, the policy implementation. Um, that's just 
uh, a sampling of non-experimental experimental methods. There are more, um, and we really believe this could move um, uh, public mental health implementation research forward. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, we have a question uh, that has been submitted anonymously about how uh, a lot of the conventional approaches towards funding mental health initiatives and interventions tend to be project-based, which creates a culture of grant-seeking behavior and grant-seeking researchers um, who have almost like cracked the code of how to get grants um, and are more focused on fulfilling donor expectations rather than uh, having a vision of long-term scale-up. So their question is about... Um, if you know, so we're seeing some of the donors trying to turn towards uh, funding organizations with a track record rather than having like um, temporary or temporal projects. Uh, so this is this question is open to all the panelists. What are your thoughts about this culture that exists, and um, specifically, how does being as a um, funding initiative um, aim to address this? I could share a few things here. I think this is a very important question, and I may not have perfect answer to this, but I could share about our efforts to, to make sure like this is not the case. For instance, under being initiative, we, we put only one conditionality, which is that any organization which is applying to our grant should have been legally registered in that country or should have some kind of engagement with that country. So that is only conditionality that we have put down as an eligibility criteria for us. So we are, as a Grand Challenges Canada, we have been taking efforts to ensure like, and most of our organizations that we support are, are startups and are very young organizations that we have been supporting. Uh, and we have been also trying to engage like a scale up is important. So how do we create collaborations and partnership with scaling partners with donors, institutional donors. But again, the issue lies with the sustainability. I think it is important that we should also find scaling partners who could sustain these interventions either in the form of public sector or the private sector. So I would pause here, um, but I think this is a very brief response for me. Thank you, over to you, Chair. Thank you. Um, is there any other speaker who'd like to jump in and uh, share their thoughts on, on the question? I can jump in on this one. I think Sahil gave a great response and that being is in many ways a model of the direction we want to move here. This is an issue that the commission raises and that I think is a central problem in terms of producing the kinds of integrated implementation effectiveness evidence that we want in the mental health world. And it's one that really resonates with me as a researcher who, uh, as you stated, spent many years early in my career figuring out how to crack the code and have been judged successful for doing so, which I think is probably not the metric of success that uh, anyone should truly be judged on, right? It should be about impact. <laughs> uh, so so totally resonates. Um, the commission you know, talks about this in terms of thinking about moving from the project-based funding to portfolio-based funding where you can fund multiple phases of research um, integrated together. We see examples of this um, in some cases already with things like center grants. Um, those, of course, also often operate on you know five or eight year cycles and then may run into a cliff, but are in some ways an improvement over your sort of typical, very discrete uh, single research project and that they are integrating projects across um, a spectrum of implementation and effectiveness. I think, uh, you know, Sahil alluded to this idea of sort of funding partnerships for scaling from the beginning, which I think is absolutely critical and is often a really missing piece here. Partnerships are hard. They take a lot of time to build well and to maintain well and to ensure that they're truly equal. And funding, you know, my grants don't include any money for those partnerships. We're trying to do them sort of on the side. And, and that that is um, a big impediment to sustainability. So models of funding that sort of think from the beginning about scalability. You know, do you have partners in place or can we help you get partners in place 
that can make this scalable long term and then actually financially supporting those partnerships is really key. Thank you. Thank you, Beth, um, for taking part of that question. Um, we have another question from John Paul Rudwal, who has been asking about, you know, when we're talking about the um, implementation research gap, um, is this something that, you know, we can look to other areas of public health to learn from? Or is uh, mental health, you know, kind of a trailblazer in trying to address uh, this gap? can start us off on that one too. I think we can absolutely look to area, other areas of mental health. One of the things the commission struggled with at, throughout writing this piece was, is this recommendation specific to mental health? Um, and where we ultimately came down was, you know, particularly important in the mental health context. And I think mental health is a trailblazer for a reason that I'll get to in a moment. But at many of the principles and recommendations the commission was focused on were sort of broader than mental health and could be applied elsewhere. And much of the research that we drew upon in the implementation science space more generally is not mental health specific. It is applied to other uh, contexts, um, you know, ranging from um, infectious disease to from diabetes to a, a whole spectrum of, of health conditions. So I would encourage us um, you know, to think about uh, the mental health implementation gap as, as an imperative and that mental health has, has often been ignored uh, and is heavily stigmatized, but so are other, other conditions, right? And so there's sort of a fine line between prioritizing the importance of mental health and, and problematic exceptionalism here. Um, you know, where I think mental health is a trailblazer is um, in the U.S. context in which I am embedded. The National Institute of Mental Health has been an early adopter and a consistent supporter of implementation research. Um, the NIMH uh, founded the Implementation Research Institute, which has trained many of the implementation researchers in the U.S. And it's a very narrow U.S. context, but it's where a lot of the funding is coming from. Um, and so relative to other uh, NIH and just other U.S.-based health funders, the NIMH has um, really been a supporter of implementation research. Most of that funding has been domestic, but there have also been some global health funding examples out of NIMH. And so there is more evidence in the mental health context than in some other areas in the implementation science space for that reason. Thank you, Beth. Um, go ahead, Milton. Well, I thank you, everybody. So I want to be a little critical. Yes, uh, NIH has done a little bit of implementation science. I'm not quite sure that it's the 10% that it's needed. And there are other countries that have done global mental health implementation science research prior to us in the US uh, that we have learned uh, from them. I also want to mention that, you know, having been in the world of HIV, both as a clinical psychiatrist and doing research, it's only recently that the big funders have decided to include a little bit of mental health within this. And, you know, hopefully I will not get crucified for saying this out loud. It's such a small amount and it's not really accomplishing what it's supposed to. And this is years after we know that mental health is one of the worst comorbidities to have in HIV, like in many other diseases. So the problem is that we are like an appendix of medical illnesses, of health illnesses, and yet the funding that we get, it's minimal and we have to struggle to get it. So it's time for the funders who have the scale up funding to make sure that the 10% that it's it's there and it's not just you know the 0.1 to 2% that it's what's being offered. And sorry if I offended anybody. Thank you, Milton. Um, I'm just aware of the time. Um, we have received so many wonderful questions and we haven't even, even gotten to maybe, you know, 40% of them. Uh, so if, if it's okay with the speakers, I'd love to take a few more minutes just to answer maybe two more questions um, that have been the most commonly kind of asked questions, if that's okay. 
All right, I'm getting some nods. Okay, so um, we have um, a question that has been asked by several participants, um, kind of highlighting some of the equity uh, gaps that were discussed uh, within implementation and research. Um, and it points to the gap that exists within low to middle income countries in not only supporting the capacitation of researchers, uh, building some of the ecosystems and the structures that essentially uh, kind of uh, predetermine one's ability to even participate um, in research and implementation. So um, this is open to all the speakers since it was asked by many participants. So I can start us off. I'd love to hear from other folks as well who are more in the global health context in a day-to-day -day than I am. I think that it's exactly right in terms of what the challenges are. And so, you know, in thinking about how to overcome that, it is really an amplification, I think, of the commission's call to emphasize funding for mental health implementation research to low and middle income country based researchers and institutions in structures potentially that um, truly have equitable sort of two-way communication and supports. You know, I think often we think about, oh, like these high income countries and research institutions will sort of swoop in and show you how to do it. And I, that's a terrible attitude that doesn't work um, and is alienating. Um, and there is certainly more need for all of that infrastructure. I think the kind of global mental health implementation network that we call for and that Milton called for is uh, potentially part of a solution here where there really is two-way learning high income countries doing mental health implementation research have an enormous amount to learn from low and middle income countries. And one of the examples the commission highlights, which is near and dear to my heart, is low and middle income country based mental health implementation researchers have done a much, much better job at thinking about policies and health system strengthening in the context of implementation. Whereas in the US in particular, implementation research has been very zeroed in on sort of individual level treatments and how to scale those um, with often sort of provider level implementation strategies. Not that those are not important, um, but they are fairly downstream and are not addressing some of the social determinants of mental health that are really critical to um, equity. So I think that that sort of network with 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 two way communication and um, structures in place to support it is really what's needed. Thank you so much for highlighting that, Beth. Um, Milton, we'll go to you next. Uh, Beth, thank you for taking that away from me. But you know, I cannot emphasize it more. So I started my global work in Brazil doing HIV prevention, and uh, you know, Karen McKinnon and Lydia Govea represent sort of like the history of what we've been doing. It's funny how we call capacity building because we're providing capacity to them in research, but the reality is that I've learned much more from any of the countries that I've worked with than anything that I have. It sort of like has been a stimulus to think together what are the best ways to implement it. That's exactly what implementation science is, right? Is the context, is the adaptation and figuring out how to work it out. And we researchers, clinicians from every area have to figure out how to implement it accordingly. So the context is what determines that. And I think that our respect for that is what has brought global mental health to be so significant. Because sometimes in the US, we have not been that respectful of communities. We are you know, very far away from really doing total participation and uh, partnerships with communities. Whereas in global mental health, that's sort of like, at least for my team and everybody that we've worked with, it's about absolute partnership and learning from both sides. And we need to learn about that in the US because we don't, we don't do enough of that. Thank you. Um, we'll go to Malvika next. 
Thanks. And this is in some ways just um, echoing and iterating what's already been said, but uh, also to share the WHO Alliance for Health Policy and Systems Research has been doing a lot on implementation research over the past several years, especially in low and middle income countries as well, and also focusing some of that um, cross learning that we were talking about and knowledge sharing across contexts and countries that is very important. And also um, in the context of that knowledge sharing, I think transdisciplinary implementation research can play a very important role because uh, mental health is something that cuts across everything, right? It cuts across, you know, ecological and climate change, as we're seeing now, it cuts across almost every dimension of health that we see. So really taking a whole of systems approach where we're bringing together researchers, practitioners, community organizations, community leaders. And when we talk about youth mental health, for example, especially young people themselves as um, important agents of change and important agents um, of creating this, uh, the research agenda, conducting the research process um, and shaping implementation research priorities moving forward, I think can play a very important role that um, we all need to play a role in facilitating. Thank you. Thank you so much for that. Um, and uh, I think this is such a great note to kind of conclude on because we're talking about, you know, uh, having the, that pipeline, it's not just research to implementation, but rather all the, the rich knowledge that comes from implementation science and understanding the context, uh, which requires addressing the gap on both sides as well as in between. Um, so uh, I'm, I'm cognizant of the time. So I want to uh, thank everybody for participating. I want to kind of conclude on just some key takeaways, just one quick sentence from each uh, speaker. Um, if we haven't gotten a chance to get to your question. Um, uh, just thank you for submitting it. This is a topic we could continue to talk about for many, many hours. Um, and we have kept a record of, of your questions and hope to be able to address them in the future. Um, you will find all the information for the reports shared within the chat, uh, the links where you can find them so you can explore the work further. Um, and I'll, I'll start us off um, by like one key takeaway, and then maybe we can go to each of the speakers. Um, personally, I've been uh, struck by kind of highlighting some of the strengths that can come out of low to middle income countries when addressing the research to implementation gaps and how uh, we can learn from low to middle income countries how to strengthen the entire system and take a systems view to our work. Um, I'll pass it on to Beth. Yeah, thank you. Perhaps building on that, I think the thing that uh, has struck me throughout the commission process and that struck me even more in this conversation is how much enhanced global partnership around mental and mental health implementation is needed, even within what is in the grand scheme of things, sort of a teeny tiny field, mental health implementation research. We have uh, silos uh, across contexts that are problematic in, in a really significant way. And and we need to break those down and uh, work together. Thank you. We'll go to you next, Matthew. Thank you. Um, I think the thing that I was uh, most struck by is the the things we we talk about in the commission are, are really hard to do. It's really hard to break down this traditional pipeline. It's really hard to um, uh, co-create um, uh, uh, research together and in, in an integrated way. But the thing I'm struck by is um, there were so many people here today that want to do it, um, both my fellow panelists here, but also everyone in the audience. So there's so much um, energy around making these changes that even though um, they're very hard to do, I'm struck with a level of optimism uh, for the future that we'll be able to to tackle them. Thank you. Uh, Sahe, we'll go to you next. Yeah, thank you so much. And I would say the one thing that really struck me is about mental health equity. I would say, like, I think there's a need to decipher this term and there's a need to, like, implement and see what does it mean in terms of the actual sense. I think the path that if you really want to work on mental health equity, it lies with the communities. Like, how do we hear from the communities and devise solutions from their perspectives? So this is, I would say, like, uh, my key takeaway. And I would say mental health equity. Yeah, perfect. Uh, I'll pause it over to Dr. Thank you, Sahil. 
Um, oh, great. We have <laughs> we have a, a clear statement from Milton. We need a minimum of 10% of the funding. Uh, do you want to expand on that? No, I think every, <laughs> everyone has been saying what else needs to be said, but we need a minimum of 10% of the funding anywhere there's funding. Otherwise, we're all going to be lagging behind always. And we'll have these panels like forever, which we shouldn't. Thank you, Milton. Uh, Malvika, we'll go to you next. Thank you. What's there to say that already hasn't been said? Um, but just really, I think, op also optimistic about everything that's been said today and um, the interest that's shown in implementation research. And I think especially amidst kind of this poly crisis that we're seeing with climate, ecolo the ecological crisis, all of the different things that are impacting mental health, especially for young people around the world. Um, implementation research, I think, has the potential to significantly transform how we do research and how we do um, practice and action on the, um, in the ground. So excited for what's to come and how we can uh, shed more light on mental health programs and policies to drive meaningful change. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. And thank you again for the partnership that has enabled this webinar, um, the Being Initiative, the Lancet Psychiatry, United for Global Mental Health and Global Mental Health Action Network, as well as our all of our speakers, you know, also from UNICEF and Columbia University. Uh, thank you so much for your participation. Um, I also want to especially thank Anthony and Aviwe who have been supporting us in the background. They have been part of this conversation, even though they weren't visible. This this would not have been possible without them. So thank you so much for all your effort and work. Thank you everybody who took the time to join us and to be part of this conversation and for opening the space and being open to, you know, participating in these types of uh, partnerships and this much needed work. Uh, thank you again to our speakers for your participation. This has been a wonderful conversation and it's been an honor to kind of create space for it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Jihad. Thank you, Zihab. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you, everybody.